Okay, well, thank you guys for uh, having me here today. It's uh, actually a lot of fun to come back to campus and see how everything's uh, changed uh, over the last 10 years. It doesn't seem like that long, but things are, campus is a lot nicer than it even used to be back then. So um, let me tell you a little bit about myself and uh, about the company. So um, I actually worked in a coaches group as well as a David Miller's group uh, here back in the late 90s and early part of the uh, first decade of the century. Uh, graduated in 2003, uh, made a lot of good friends here, and uh, two of my good friends ended up being uh, co-founders of Solar Junction. So uh, Mike Weimer, Holman UN coach, and a couple of uh, semiconductor veterans. Uh, we founded Solar Junction um, almost uh, six years ago. Uh, I've been working in this space. And our mission is to manufacture multi-junction solar cells for uh, terrestrial CPV systems, as well as multi-junction solar cells for space satellites. So we're down in San Jose. We have about 45 to 50 employees. We've been venture funded since day one, uh, raised over $60 million, and uh, so far have been uh, pretty successful in developing our technology. We have the last two world records in multi-junction solar cell efficiency under concentration. And what I want to, what I hope to impart uh, on you today is that um, multi-junction solar cells, I think compared to other parts of PV, they have a huge headroom for improvement in efficiency as well as cost reduction. And so I think this is one of the reasons why this area of PV is ripe for further innovation uh, and a lot of uh, exciting things coming in the near future. So. Um, Here's an outline of my talk. Um, I'll start with an introduction and, and provide some general context for how multi-junction solar cells work in CPV systems, and just a little bit of background about CPV systems. And then I'll talk about the physics of multi-junction solar cells. Uh, I know you guys are, are very familiar with how solar cells work. And so what I'm going to try to do is just point out the key differences that are unique to multi-junction solar cells as well as multi-junction solar cells under concentration. So I've given you way more slides than we're going to cover today. Um, so I will be flipping through some of the slides very quickly. But I think that material you should already know pretty well. And the slides that we pause on, I hope, are, are going to be more interesting for you. Um, and then I'm going to go into, in, in the third section of this talk, um, some of the system integration issues of what you need to engineer when you put multi-junction solar cells within a CPV system. CPV systems are optical systems, and so just like your eye, you know, is, an, is an, my eye, for example, is behind an optical system, which is my, my set of glasses, my set of glasses have to be tuned to my particular um, def defects in my eye. The same is true in multi-junction solar cells in CPV systems, and this is something that's not uh, widely talked about. So I, I think that'll be really interesting for you guys to uh, learn about. And then what I'll do, which I think is going to be really fun, is give you an overall technology review of what's going on in the industry. Today there's a race to increase efficiency as quickly as possible, uh, and I think reaching 50% efficiency is just within reach in the next uh, three years or so. And during this, I will uh, give you an idea of what we're doing at Solar Junction. So you guys have been studying different PV technologies for the last several weeks. Uh, you've looked at crystalline silicon, polysilicon. I know you'll be looking at thin film solar cells uh, here in the coming weeks. Uh, over in the upper left is a typical multi-junction solar cell. Uh, for CPV, these cells are small. Uh, some of the differences between these cells and what, you'll, uh, what you guys have been studying are, is that these materials that are used in multi-junction solar cells, at least for CPV in space, are direct band gap semiconductors. And what that means is their absorption coefficients are very high. That then directly translates into these being thin film solar cells. So rather than using a solar cell which is 50 microns or 200 microns thick, these solar cells, you know, they're, they're a certain class of thin film solar cells. They're 5 to 10 to maybe 15 microns in total thickness. And again, it's because we're using direct band gap semiconductors. Uh, today, these cells are about 40% under efficiency. The company I work for is delivering cells at about 42 to 43% in production volumes. And again, these solar cells have the opportunity to get to about 
in the coming years, whereas other PV technologies are really looking at uh, more incremental improvements in their efficiency. So I know that Anish uh, uh, talked to you a little bit about what CPV is, uh, but I'll give you a reminder here. So in CPV, what we're doing is we are trading the area of a semiconductor and instead replacing that with a very inexpensive optical lens or mirror and focusing light down onto a very small solar cell. These cells are on the order of a millimeter to a centimeter on a side. And because these cells are small, they're a small portion of the overall system cost. And because that cost is small, you can actually use a very sophisticated solar cell technology in these systems. These systems are mounted in arrays, just as in any other PV system, and they're actually mounted on a two-axis tracker. So these systems directly track the sun throughout the day, just as a sunflower sort of does throughout the day. And um, a couple of uh, facts to point out, the concentration level that's being used in the industry today is between typically 500 suns and 1,500 suns. And what I mean by concentration ratio is the area of the lens divided by the area of the solar cell. So when I talk about number of suns, uh, at one sun, that's the, that's the concentration if you were to stick the solar cell directly out in sun. And when I talk about a thousand suns, it means there's a thousand times more light focused down onto that one solar cell. Yes, people are using 1500 commercially. In fact, uh, there are systems today that are being uh, developed and soon will be deployed at 2000 suns. Now, one of the things, it's a good question, because one of the things that happens when you increase concentration, your angular acceptance, so the angular tolerance of your optical system with respect to the sun becomes tighter and tighter. So these two-axis trackers, they're very big. You can see the picture of the car over on the right. These two-axis trackers, um, I should say, the system can be several stories high. These two-axis trackers point the optical axis uh, within, towards the sun within plus or minus 0.3 or 4 degrees. So these are very, very complex uh, algorithms. They're sun sensors, which you can't really see here, and they have very sophisticated feedback loops to keep that tracker directly at the sun, uh, even under a wide range of wind conditions and, and whatnot. And typically, just to give you an idea, I think when the um, wind speed gets above 30 to 40 miles an hour, there's an algorithm that turns the entire module flat so that you don't get that huge shearing force against the, uh, uh, against the entire module. So, um, go ahead, did you have a question? Yeah, people think they can do it. They can do it cost effectively and reliably. You can do it, yeah. It works though. It works now. You know, even even in a year's time, um, there's the yeah yeah it, it isn't. But you you put these things under accelerated testing and and whatnot. And there there's actually a large number of companies out there that believe that you know thousand x fifteen hundred x two thousand x over that many years is actually uh, is actually possible. So. Um, you know, there's a little bit of a debate in the industry as we had last summer, but yeah. um, there are people deploying that. Yeah, so these little squares, that is a single lens cell unit. So one of one of these systems over here, one of those combinations, can't sort of see it here, is one of these squares here. So there's an array of these optical optical trains. Yeah, so the, the cell is just is located, you know, about this far down beneath the uh, beneath the lens. For now, lens is probably the number one choice of uh, the, the primary optic. 
Um, it's typically a Fresnel lens followed by an optical homogenizer. So it allows you to get a much flatter uh, uh, and spectrally flat and intensity flat beam over the solar cell. And that actually allows you to get higher performance. It is higher cost, so people are always looking at ways of what is the cheapest optical system uh, versus cost and trade-off. So, yeah. Um, just a little bit about the solar spectrum. So uh, these optical systems, uh, due to thermodynamics, you can only capture the direct portion of the solar spectrum. What I mean by that is light which is not scattered by anything in the atmosphere, either clouds or aerosols. So what that means, and this is a really important point, is if you have a two-axis tracker that's directly pointing at the sun, the global irradiance that you'll get on average is about 1,000 watts per square meter. The direct portion of that in a very sunny climate is going to be about 900 watts per square meter. So one of the things you have to keep in mind when you're analyzing a CPV system is there is a 10 to 20 percent loss in the amount of radiation that you can collect compared to a standard PV system. And this is one of the reasons why the cell efficiencies need to be driven higher and higher to keep the performance and cost of CPV in par on par of where it needs to be compared to regular PV systems. And this just gives you an example of this. So this is in Golden, Colorado. Um, it's very high altitude. It's actually a relatively cold place. And here what they're plotting is DNI, which is the direct normal irradiance, versus GNI, which is the global normal irradiance, over the year. And in this particular location, the direct to, glo to global ratio is about 85 to 90%. Now what this means is if you go to a location in the world where that ratio is 70% or 60%, CPV is not going to provide more power than another PV technology. It's not capturing enough of the solar radiation to give you a high enough power output. And in that case, a traditional flat plate PV technology is going to be the solution of choice. Now, when you are in a very sunny climate, the high DNI area, one of the typical things you see is these systems are significantly higher performance. The yellow curve is a, is a power output for a CPV system in Phoenix, Arizona. It's on a two-axis tracker, and because you're tracking the sun throughout the day, you get a nice square energy output profile compared to the other PV technologies. Because those other PV technologies are uh, fixed tilt, you get cosine loss throughout the day. So that's why those curves look like they have a, a cosine modulation at all. Yeah, so it turns out the sweet spot between cost and performance is you likely want, so, so they have one axis, uh, one axis parabolic trows uh, where you have just like a parabola type of mirror and then a 1D array of lenses, uh, sorry, of, of solar cells. And it, typically that uh, the cost performance trade-off isn't good enough. So you either want a traditional fixed tilt, fixed tilt flat plate or that on a one axis tracker or CPV, which is on a two-axis tracker. And a lot of the technologies you're referring to have been looked at over the years, but none of those companies has been successful to date so far. So this is the exciting thing about CPV. Um, uh, this is a comparison of cell efficiency, module efficiency, system efficiency in a high DNI climate. Uh, what you'll find is the cell efficiencies are one and a half to maybe even three times more efficient. This is a dated slide, so it doesn't have the best cell efficiencies on there, but one and a half to three times more efficient uh, compared to uh, regular PV technologies. This translates then downstream into higher module efficiency and system efficiency. Now again, one of the things that's very exciting is with the, with, with the prospect of a 50% solar cell in the future, you're going to see the CPV technology have a big boost just over the next three to five years, whereas when you look at the other technologies, they're only going to go up incrementally, maybe 5 to 10% relative, whereas CPV can go up maybe 25% relative and more. In a high DNI climate, now this, this gives you, uh, uh, you know, an, a, an idea of the energy yield measured in megawatt hours for different locations around the world. So Yayan, Spain has a DNI of 5.5 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day on average. 
all the way out to Chile. Chile, uh, uh, remarkably, is it, it's like it has no so no coverage at all. It's almost directly on the sun. It has the largest amount of sunlight. There are places in Chile where there, it has never been recorded to 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 it rain. So there there's a desert in Chile where they've never known it to rain, and that gets. 9.8 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. So imagine this, you're looking at DNI only 900 watts per square meter to get 9.8 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. That's almost 10 hours of direct sunlight with zero cloud coverage per day. It's probably the only place in the world that has it. But what it gives you is an idea of the trade-off between DNI and the energy output that you're going to be able to get from CPV versus the other uh, PV technologies. Once you get down below six and into like the 5.5 range, CPV loses its benefit because it's no longer capturing uh, as much sunlight as a traditional flat plate PV collector. Um, Daggett, yeah. So, yeah. So Rajasthan is like right here. That has pretty good DNI. So that's annual sun. So typically. Um, all of the studies are saying when the annual um, DNI is above 2,000 kilowatt hours per meter squared per day, CPV can be competitive. And so parts of India um, can be competitive. But the interesting thing is South India, it's very hot, but there's a lot of humidity. And so it actually, you actually don't get very good DNI. Asia, Southeast Asia is horrible for DNI. Look at China. It, it, this is not pollution. This is actually humidity in the air. So even though even though large parts of Asia, yeah, that that's that that's maybe not quite in this in this plot here. But um, so CPV is going to de be deployed in Southwest U.S., Latin America, um, South America, Australia. Although the economics in Australia really favor coal energy uh, rather than uh, solar, uh, the Middle East, North Africa and uh, parts of China. So actually, the uh, parts of China near Mongolia uh, are now getting hundreds of megawatts of CPV installation um, actually starting last year. So just a little bit more about CPV before I get into uh, the, the, the physics of these cells. So um, what are some of the things that can make CPV successful? So it's a relatively new technology. And, and let me caveat that. So. Back when Coach was, uh, uh, prior to his days at Stanford, Coach was actually one of the pioneers in CPV cell technology and system technology. So this was in the, I believe it was the late 70s and, and early 80s. There was a lot of CPV research, along with a lot of other PV research. And that all died down once Reagan came into power. And for about 20, I would say about 20 or 25 years, CPV sort of stood still. There were, there were a few companies uh, pursuing it, uh, pursuing multi-junction solar cells for space, but almost no activity in CPV. So today, CPV is immature compared to, uh, to the other PV technologies that you're studying. To date, there's only been about 100 megawatts to 150 megawatts of CPV deployed around the world, compared to about 40 gigawatts or more uh, deployed for conventional PV technologies. And what that means is as, there, as there's more volume deployed to CPV, its cost is going to drop dramatically, which is going to allow um, it to scale in a big way in the sunny climates around the world. Concentration is another lever. As you increase the concentration, you increase the area of the optic that you're using to collect the light. You decrease the number of solar cells that you need to use in your system. This drives down cost. Furthermore, one of the exciting things about CPV is as you increase the performance and reduce the cost of these systems, the geographic area over which it becomes economically feasible expands. And so I've got a really nice slide to show you that here in a minute. Um, just to drive down in the, into the technology, um, this is a picture of a 4-inch wafer that we made at Solar Junction. It's got a few hundred solar cells on there. And one of the things that's different about this PV technology compared to traditional flat plate are, is uh, these cells are chips. So these, these are chips that are one millimeter to about a centimeter on the side. They share the same material set as the LED industry. And so one of the really nice things is we get to piggyback off of all of the manufacturing 
uh, learning that has gone on in the LED industry. And we have a pathway to make these materials and the wafer processing and the entire manufacturing process very, very cheap. Now, one of the interesting things about concentration is um, take a 1,000x th uh, system. This wafer, I should say the cells from this wafer under a 1,000x concentration will produce about 2 kilowatts of power. So a wafer this big can supply 2 kilowatts of power. If you take traditional PV where the cells are 6 inches on a side and the modules are, are, are pretty big, you're going to need a lot more room to be able to generate 2 kilowatts of power. What that means for a company like Solar Junction is within a regular, relatively small facility, you can manufacture hundreds of megawatts of uh, CPV solar cells. Whereas if you look at a thin film company or a company like SunPower, in order for them to have a factory that builds 200 or 300 megawatts a year, they need gigantic, gigantic facilities. So this is, again, one of the benefits of moving to concentration. The material usage of the semiconductor is small. And really, you're just trading that off with very inexpensive glass. Uh, we're using gallium arsenide and germanium. Um, just to drive the point home, if you look at all the other PV technologies in the world, um, they've, had, they've matured uh, you know, over the last 10 years. The incremental improvements in efficiency you're seeing are very small. If you look at the uh, top curve on the right, as well as this curve, which actually just got updated this week, multi-junction solar cells are increasing the efficiency very rapidly. You're going to see the line for under concentration go up above 50%. And for even one sun, uh, this was a result announced by Spectralab for a five junction solar cell last week. You're going to see that line breach 40% just in the coming years. And so I think this is one of the most exciting um, areas of photovoltaics. And with this efficiency, when you look at CPV, here's what it does to the market which you can address with this technology. As you go from, and this was a study done by Richard King at Spectralab. As you change efficiency, you go from being able to target the highest DNI areas to now expanding to lower DNI areas. And Richard King did this study where if you had a 50% cell with an 85% optical efficiency, you could now address a much larger portion of the United States and make it economically feasible. So this is another reason why there's a race on to make the cell efficiency much more efficient than it um, is even today.